Since last year, I have been hosting Financial Success Summit. This is our annual virtual personal finance conference where we get guests look from local and from uh, international locations as well. And they teach us about the various concepts of finance and from something very broad as personal finance to something very specific. And in this week's video, we are looking at the presentation from property coach, South African and international property coach, uh, Lawrence Bow, and he's going to teach us on how we can start accessing finance for property investment. All right, guys, welcome to our sessions, uh, second session. We're talking about financing for, for property investments. And, you know, as a financial advisor, uh, I'm a big believer that uh, wealth building doesn't just lie in buying shares and unit trusts and that kind of thing. we got to diversify. Um, big fan of crypto. <laughs> it's not financial advice like property investments, commodities as well. So I invited Lawrence on and he's going to um, share with us some of his stuff. So here's the thing with Lawrence, right? So Lawrence is in somewhere in rural South Africa and he did a, a, a recording for us and we're going to jump into that recording um, with him and his finances. And if we have any um, any questions for him, he's going to share uh, that with us in, in our follow-up sessions, in our pre uh, recorded sessions, which you all have access to. So let me pull up that video and we'll get started with Lawrence. Lawrence Poole. I'm a professional property investor with over 10 years of experience in investing in property. Um, I'm also a author with a couple of books on my name. Uh, first one being Financial Freedom Through Property, the second being Millionaire in the Making. Uh, you can get these books on my website at lawrencepool.com or at any exclusive books near you. Um, other than investing in property, I uh, work in the IT department of a financial services company as a computer scientist. Uh, I am financially independent, which basically means that if I were to lose my job, I could survive and live off the property income that I generate passively. I focus mostly on multi-lets and blocks of flats. Uh, things like student accommodation as well have a I have a exposure with that um, and uh, and I've, I've been the founder of a uh, tool called the my property app which you will see a little bit later today uh, now the reason why I joined property as a as a as, a, as an investment class is because well I think the system that I was told to follow when I was younger didn't really work out right I uh, I did everything that my parents my teachers my peers said was the right way to go about things I got a good degree I studied BSc computer science at the University of Pretoria I got my honors I then did the next step which is get a good job at a good company um, I started working as you can see here this is my first day uh, uh, as part of the graduate acceleration program for dimension data which was and is still a major uh, IT player in the global economy um, I spent a year doing my graduate program and after um, three, four years of working there and, and establishing myself as a key member, um, I was retrenched. You know, it's funny how you can go from being a valued employee to a line of a spreadsheet very quickly. And it's very easy to delete a line when, uh, you know, when that time comes and when the company is um, needing to cut costs. So uh, that was the day that I realized that the system that my parents, my teachers, my peers had always told me was the system we had to follow to succeed in life. It doesn't work anymore. You know, I, I just don't believe in the idea of getting a safe degree, working at a safe job for 40 years and retiring at 65 happily. Um, I just don't think that having one source of income is a sustainable approach to securing yourself financially in this economy. Now, retirement planning is something that we all have to keep in mind. Um, so in terms of how much you need to save, well, the answer is actually quite simple. You need to take what your annual spending is going to be when you want to retire times that number by anything between 20 to 30, and that'll give you the lump sum of capital that you need saved to be able to sustain your lifestyle spend. So if your goal is to retire on 30,000 Rand per month as an income level, times that by 25, which is the, the middle between 20 and 30, means that your total capital saved in some sort of retirement fund savings account or something with you know an interest bearing nature uh, it needs to be about nine million right so you can now look at your salary and say okay cool i'm putting aside how much am i putting aside five thousand per month i'm putting that into an ra or some sort of retirement scheme you know in 30 to 40 years of saving will i have the nine million rand in capital savings that i need to be able to sustain my retirement um 
the reality is, and, and the reason why people spend 40 years working is because they need 40 years of saving to reach this level of retirement savings so that they can retire happily. If your goal was 50,000 Rand in monthly spend, your savings goal would be 15 million. And if your goal is 100,000, your retirement saving is 30 million. Um, and this is the reason why most people spend 40 years of their, of their greatest years um, you know, sacrificing and surrendering in silence to, to their boss, to their ungrateful, underpaying boss uh, who gives you the occasional keep it short or get fired holiday. Um, you know, so when, you, when, when I look back at the system that I was told to follow, the get a degree, get a good job, retire happily at 65, you know, it just doesn't make sense to sacrifice your best years, your golden years of, of 20 to 60 when you've got the energy and you've got the zest for life that you want to travel, you want to see the world, you're, you're surrendering in silence to, to a job um, that, you know, will hopefully give you enough income to, to retire at 65. It just didn't make sense. Um, there's an alternative, right? Instead of investing in a, a retirement passively, you can take charge of your financial destiny. You can take charge of investing for yourself and investing is the key word. That is where your financial freedom is going to sit is when you take personal accountability for how your money grows and your retirement planning. Now, investing can take many different forms, right? Uh, you can look at um, stock investing, you know, buying shares of companies. You can buy Google, Apple, Facebook, all of these different mechanisms. And, you know, you can buy into companies that grow over time and you can then grow your wealth through them. Uh, you can go for index funds or ETFs, Satrix Top 40 or the Coronation Fund, where you buy into a bucket of top performing companies. You know, that's a, that's a safer, less risky approach to investing in the stock market. You can go ultra risky you can go into things like nfts or bitcoin or high frequency trading where you know you can get rich quickly but you can also get poor quickly uh, you can start your own business you can start a you know a hair salon or a nail business or you can do a drop shipping company or you can start a construction business obviously if you've got the skills the contacts and the energy you can start your own business and start to generate wealth through that uh, the other alternative is property Right? And, and the reason why property has spoken to me and has become the asset class that I believe will create that long-term wealth for me is because property in its nature is generational wealth. You know, it's something that as I build my portfolio and my wealth, I can pass it on to my kids and they can pass it on to their kids. The other thing that I really like about property is that it's passive. You know, once you've bought the property, you've, you've put in a tenant and that tenant is being managed by a good managing agent, you know, it's something that's happening passively. I can still maintain my full-time job as an IT professional while having a sizable property portfolio that requires maybe an hour to two hours of my time per month. Um, so you need to sit back and figure out what is the investment class or asset scheme that you're going to decide to invest in and then go wholeheartedly into it. So property became my investment of choice, right? And after my uh, pretty disappointing experience at Dimension Data, I decided I needed to get into property. So this is the first investment that I ever made. And I say investment in, in quotations because this wasn't really an asset. Uh, this was actually more a liability than it was an asset. Now, this property was in a um, very nice uh, eco estate in Yuxke Park, which is in Johannesburg North, uh, close to Four Ways, Douglasdale area. That's where it was. And this was the first property I bought using the bank's money because I had a good job at uh, Dimension Data, I had a good income, and I had a good credit score. So I decided to buy this property to start building my income. Now, the reason why this was a negative uh, and, and, and a liability is because it wasn't cash flow positive. Now, this is something that I learned from uh, Robert Kiyosaki, the, uh, the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, is that cash flow is king. Cash flow is king. If you're looking for a good asset in the property space, cash flow is king. Now, what does that mean? Now, let's use an example. On the left-hand side, you've got what I would call a property asset. And on the right-hand side, you've got a property liability. Now, a property asset is when you buy and hold a property and the rental income that you're getting, the revenue from your tenant, is greater than the expenses. So your money inflow on the property is greater than your money outflow. Now, your inflow is your rental from your tenant. The outflow are things like your bond repayments, your levies, your rates and taxes, insurance, provisions, management fee, those kind of things. If your income is greater than your expenses and you're left with some level of profit at the end of the month, that is a asset. 
That is a positive cash flow situation. A liability, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. That's when your rental income or the money inflows is less than money outflows, and you're left with a negative cash flow position, which means that you're going to have to take your salary or the income that you have from, from, from different investments to supplement this loss, right? So, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, I, I was taught, is someone who says an asset is something that puts money into your pocket. A liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. So we want to avoid the liability where we're using our salary and other incomes to fund the shortfall so that we can focus on our assets. So the cash flow on this specific property was negative. I bought it at 650, which was a good price. It was a bit of a discount. I, I was working with a motivated seller at the time. The rental, 7,000. The bond repayments, 59. So already, you know, you take the rental minus the bond, I'm only left with 1,100 Rand left over. But then I've got other expenses, levies, rates and taxes, provisions. Now, the levies on this specific property were very high because it was an eco estate. You know, we had, uh, there was probably about four or 500 units. There was security guards. There was a maintenance team. There was a gardening service. All of these shared services needed to be funded by the landlords. You know, so I ended up investing two and a half thousand rand every month into the levies, which basically left me with a negative cash flow position of 3,000 rand per month. So that, that cash flow or that, that loss was being funded by my salary. Now, what I'll show you a little bit later is that the banks look at us based on our affordability. The higher our affordability, the higher our potential of loans that we can get from the bank. The lower our affordability, the less likely the bank is gonna loan to us. Now, if you've got a negative cash flow investment, that means you're gonna have to take from your salary, reduce your salary, pay this off, thus reducing your affordability, thus reducing your attractiveness to the bank to get a larger loan facility. So Robert Kiyosaki, author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, states very simply, an asset is something that puts money into your pocket. If you've got a cash flow positive property, that means money is coming into your pocket. It is making you wealthier. If you've got a negative cash flow property, it's taking money out of your pocket. It's making you poorer. It is a liability. So the house that you live in, your primary residence, and any kind of holiday home that's not being used for Airbnb is a liability because that's something that you have to put money into for it to work. Like, for example, your car is most likely a liability unless you Uber it out. Right? If the Uber service that you're providing creates more income than expenses, then you've got an asset versus a liability. So once I was, uh, you know, I learned these, uh, you know, these secrets of financial management, the things I never learned at school, but after going on Robert Kiyosaki's course and Grant Cardone and, and working with Tony Robbins and all of these different inspirational speakers who teach financial aspects, I realized that I was sitting on a liability. So I decided to get out. So I flipped the property, which essentially means I uh, renovated it. You can see here some of the after photos, which is to, to you know, repaint, retile. I fixed up the kitchen. I fixed up the bathroom, all the while trying to force the value of the property to go up so that I could sell it for a premium price, get out and reinvest into um, an asset. So I was quite lucky to sell this property for quite a lot. I sold it for 950. Um, after putting in 80,000 Rand worth of uh, renovations, I forced the value up quite nicely. And I ended up walking away with a profit of 160,000. Uh, so I was lucky to still get out of this deal in a profitable space. But um, this was definitely the worst investment that I made because I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. I wasn't taught at school. I didn't, wasn't taught by my parents, my peers, or my teachers how to look at an asset, how to evaluate a, a property deal. Um, I really just, you know, I kind of, I knew property was a good idea and I jumped in head first. Um, but now I have a very different approach to property investing. I only look at cash flow positive investments. In fact, the last uh, three investments that I've made, you can see on the screen, are all cash flow positive from day one. So I've got a block of six units in Rosettenville, making 7,000 Rand passive profit every month. I've got another six units in Kenilworth, making 8,000 Rand per month. And then I've got four units in Forest Hill, all in the Joburg South area, making 6,000 Rand in cash flow. So now when I look at a property investment, it's not an asset for me unless it's cash flow positive from day one, and it needs to have a return of 12% or greater. So I hope that by the end of this session, you're going to be avoiding the property liability 
discussion. Unless it's your primary residence or you want to have a holiday home, that's totally fine. It's fine to have a liability on your books. But if you're looking to build financial freedom and wealth through property, you need to be considering the asset framework, the cash flow positive from day one. Now, let's say that you buy into this, right? And you say, okay, cool. I, I like the cash flow positive idea, but where am I supposed to find these properties? You know, I've, I've, looked, I've looked all over the place. I've looked in Bryanston. I've looked in Four Ways. I've looked in Umschlunga. I've looked in Greenpoint, Seapoint. I've looked in all these nice suburban areas. And I can tell you that none of them have enough rental income to cover the expenses. And uh, the reality is you're right. The, the cash flow positive properties are not in your middle high income zones, your suburban areas. That's not where the cash flow is. Your cash flow is in your lower income markets, in your inner cities of Johannesburg and Pretoria, places like Berea, Heelbrow, Yeovil, Sunnyside, Arcadia, Primrose. You know, those are maybe areas that have a, a negative perception. You know, a lot of people, when I tell them that I invest in Heelbrow, they think, okay, well, geez, I mean, that's quite a, isn't that a dangerous area? Isn't that, isn't it risky? And yeah, there are some risks and some dangers that come with investing in your low income market. Uh, but the yield and the return is what I'm doing it for. You know, if I wanted to invest in the likes of a Bryanston or a Santon, you know, in Joburg, um, my money is not going to be in the, in the cash flow. My money is going to be in the long-term appreciation and the equity gains over 20, 30 years because the value of those properties go up over time. But if I'm looking for cash flow, if I'm looking to buy, hold, have the rental greater than the expenses, leaving me with a monthly profit, this is where the market is. This is where the money is. So let me show you a quick example, right, just to make this a little bit more real. Here we've got a property for sale in Primrose. Um, which is a, a lower income market. You can see here it's in Germiston, which is Joburg East. Um, so this is a block of flats, um, and this is the unit that is being sold. First thing I'm noticing here is that the property is empty, so I'm going to have to find a tenant and put a tenant place, placement cost in, 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 in my numbers, which is fine. It's just something you have to be aware of. But the kitchen looks nice. It looks in pretty good condition. You know, it, it looks relatively clean and, and well-maintained. So I wouldn't have to put too much of a renovation budget in place. Um, and then here we've got levies of 1,200 rates and taxes of 300 Rand. It was listed on the 26th of January. Okay. So I'm going to go here to this app called My Property App. So you can go here, mypropertyapp.online. That is um, the tool that uh, I built together with a few partners. And this is a tool that helps you analyze deals with a little bit more confidence and flexibility. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to analyze, and we're going to run the numbers on this deal quickly together. So the asking price on this property is 350 so I'm going to go and attempt to get a, a nice healthy discount and I'm going to put an offer of 280,000 Rand. So I'm going to attempt to get a 20% discount. It's not always possible unless you're working with a highly motivated seller. You know, between 10 and 20%, I think is a reasonable discount to expect and something that you can achieve. I've gone into another app called Pocket Let, which told me that your average rental price for a two-bedroom property in Primrose, Germiston, is about 5700 So I'm going to put in here that my rental amount is 5700 Step number two, we go to buying costs. Now, of course, as a um, property investor, you'll need to pay certain costs when buying a property. So your bond registration costs, your transfer costs are included. So I'm going to put in here my purchase price of 280. I'm going to assume that I'm going to get a decent um, loan from the bank. So I'm going to go for 250,000 Rand loan and I'm going to buy it in a company name. And then here it'll tell me that my bond registration costs are 16,700. My transfer costs are just under 12,000. So I'll go here to 16,700 and 12,000 for my transfer costs. Refurb, we had a quick look at the property and I think you know we'll probably put about a 15,000 Rand budget in place. That's just to repaint, retile, maybe clean it up a little bit. Maybe there's some electrical work to be done. Based on the photos that I saw, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, but obviously I'll have a building inspector go in and give me a detailed quote as to what exactly is happening. Finance costs, let's work on a 90% loan. Now, currently, at the time of doing this, this video, um, the prime lending rate is 7.75. So I'm going to work on 9%. To be a little bit conservative, I'm expecting that the repo rate is going to go up a couple more times this year. Over 20 years, my bond repayment, the payment I need to make back to the bank as a loan, is 2200 
Now I'll go to my cash flow calculation. I'm going to put in the levies of 1,200, the rates of 300. Insurance, we can avoid that because the insurance should be in the levy statement. Now, voids. Okay, when you're investing in the low income market, you're going to have to put a provision aside for delinquent behavior. There's going to be some times when your tenant doesn't pay their rent or you're going to be, you know, having to evict someone. That's just it, it comes with the territory. Right. So I'm going to put an 8 percent provision aside for uh, voids. I'm going to put another 8 percent aside for management and then I'm going to put 4 percent aside for maintenance. So these are provisions that I'm putting aside for really like almost a rainy day fund, right? Now, if my income is 5,700, I've got all of my expenses here on the left. My monthly cash flow is going to be 724, and that's going to be a positive cash flow. Now we go to the summary tab to determine, is this a good return on investment? Here it's telling me that it's a 12% return. So if I can buy the property at 280,000 Rand and I can confirm that the rent is 5,700, my return should be 12%. Compare that to what you're getting at the bank, right? If you put your money into a money market account, you're getting about 6% maybe. So your money is working twice as hard by investing it into this property. And the great thing is your capital invested is only 71,000 because the bank is paying for most of it, right? You just have to put a deposit down and you have to pay your transfer uh, bond registration costs and your refurb costs. So here's an example of a property. It's in pretty good condition, pretty good nick. And here you'll be making 700 Rand per month positive cash flow from day one with a 12% ROI. So it's a, it, you know, it's a definite option for you to potentially consider um, as long as you're comfortable with having that risk appetite for the low income market, you can also walk away with deals like this. So the way that you can determine which areas to target, you know, so I've mentioned Hillbrow, Primrose, all of these areas. The reason why I've chosen these areas is because they have a high gross yield. What does that mean? Now, your gross yield is an indicator whether an area has positive cash flow deals or not. The calculation is very simple. It is your annual gross rent divided by your property purchase price. Times that by 100, it'll give you a percentage. All right, let's have a quick look. Let's say you're looking at a property that has a monthly rental of 10,000 Rand per month. So you times that by 12 to get your gross um, annual rental, so 120,000. And let's say that this property is selling for 800,000, right? So 120,000 is my annual rental income divided by the purchase price of 800,000 times 100 gives me a number of 15%. Now, 15% is good. Anything above 15% is what I usually recommend that my students uh, look at because that is going to be a cash flow positive area. So let's say you get a bond, uh, a loan with the bank, and the bank is going to give you an 8% interest. So 15% means that 8% is going to go to, to your bond. So you're left with 7%, right? 8 minus 15 gives you 7. So you've got 7% of your rental income, your yield, that can be used to pay for levies, rates and taxes, provisions, insurance, all of that stuff. And you'll probably be left with 1% or 2% left, which will be your positive cash flow. Let's say that you're looking at an area like Bryanston and your yield is only 10%. Now, what that means is if you get a bond with the bank and the bank is giving you an 8% loan, 8 minus 10 means you're left with 2% yield. You've only got 2% yield left over. Now you still have to pay rates and taxes, levies, insurance, provisions, etc. You're going to be left in a negative cash flow situation. So anything above 15% is a good sign. And this works in conjunction with your lending rate. So if our lending rate was 15%, a gross yield of 15% would not be good anymore, right? Our gross yield would need to be 20, 25% plus. Now, when I'm looking at a deal or an area, I will say 15% is my minimum with the current lending rate in mind, but I also look more for like 20, 25%, especially when I'm looking at student accommodation, I look for higher yields. Uh, now you don't have to be an expert to be able to invest in property. There's lots of different tools and data sets that you can leverage. One that I highly recommend is TPN. It's a credit bureau. Um, and it gives you a whole bunch of reports as to what the risk in the area is, what the yield of the area is, et cetera. So here, for example, this is a, a report that I pulled from TPN. You can see uh, some of the top performing suburbs in the Joburg area over the last year. Now, if we just look here on the left, you can see East Rand as an example. 
So here we've got Primrose, right? We've just looked at Primrose as an area, so I want to understand this a bit more. Primrose, the blue bar here is telling you what your capital appreciation estimates are. Now here we're looking at about a 4%, maybe a 3% capital appreciation. Guys, the properties in Primrose, Berea, Heelbrow, and the low income market, they're not going to expand in value. In 10, 20 years time is not when you make your money, right? That's where you want to go to Bryanston or Ilovo or some of the you know, more suburban areas. That's where you're going to make your money. The money is going to be made in the low income market with the cash flow, with the monthly rental. And the reason why I say that is look at this, look at the other two bars. The green and the red is telling you, combined is telling you your yield. So your yield here in the Primrose market is averaging 20%, which is phenomenal. That's why the deal I just showed you in Primrose is cash flow positive from day one. But your risk is quite high. This red bar is telling you your risk of delinquent behavior. So your risk of delinquent behavior in Primrose is sitting at 5%, which is quite high. You know, you compare that to the likes of an Alovo, which is in the northern suburbs, and that's more of a low risk area. You've got very minimal risk. Your risk is low, your capital appreciation is high, but your yield suffers. So it's all about what kind of investor you want to be, what risk you want to take, and then using these data sets and this, and this information, which is available to you, um, to make an informed decision. I did do a YouTube video on the investment grade suburbs of 2021 with the founder and owner of TPM, Michelle Dickens. So go check out my YouTube channel, Lawrence Property Coach. It's got uh, hundreds of hours of free content um, and a whole bunch of stuff to get you started on your journey to financial freedom through property. Let me take you through uh, one of my uh, blocks of flats, or one of my multi-lets, um, just to show you the power of uh, passive income. So this property was um, or is six times two bedrooms. It's in Rosettenville, which is a high risk area, but high yield as well. From a rental income point of view and a cash flow point of view, this one's very profitable. So my rental on average is $27,500. i have got angel finance. So I've got an angel investor who loaned me the money. I pay him back on a monthly basis, just under 14,000 Rand per month. Rates and taxes, insurance, management fee, maintenance, walking away with 7,800 Rand in profit per month with a return of 32%. Um, you know, so 7,800 is not enough to retire from. Uh, you know, I don't think that there's many people that um, can just buy this one building and then they're sorted for life, um, unless maybe they stop shopping at Willie's. Um, but you know, how, how different would your life be if you had this passive income stream of 7,800 coming in every month? You know, would that give you maybe a bit of confidence to go to your boss and say, look, you know, I appreciate my salary, but I just can't, I can't work every every Friday. You know, I need, I need some time off to spend time with my kids or follow my ambition. You know, your boss is going to say that's fine, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pay you for Friday then. Right. And that and that's not the end of the world for you because you've got now seven thousand eight hundred and you've now bought back your Friday, your Friday, your Saturday, Sunday. You can now reinvest into your family or into other projects. Maybe you find another block of flats or another deal that brings in another seven thousand five hundred. Right. So if you're buying one of these buildings every every year or two, you know, it's realistic to think that in five to ten years time, I can have enough passive income coming in from my property business that I don't have to rely on my one source of income or be dependent on my ungrateful underpaying boss, all right? The path to financial freedom is a long road that's gonna take you many years to achieve, but you know what, the time's gonna pass by anyway. Uh, and when I look at financial freedom and when I'm coaching my students, I try and break it down into three steps. Your first goal is to reach financial security. This is where you have enough passive income coming in to cover your basic living expenses. So if you had to lose your job tomorrow, how much would you need to survive to pay for groceries, for your car, for your house, for your medical aid? Uh, you know, not, not, not shopping and not uh, luxury and lifestyle, not traveling overseas. What's the bare minimum that you could get by with? Now, that goal you should be achieving in three to five years through property. Your next step is financial independence. This is the, the stage that I've just res uh, reached recently. This is where you can current you can live with your current lifestyle. So I like to travel to Europe every now and again and, and, and to the US and I like to go and explore and those kind of things. And I like to eat at nice restaurants once a week. And I, you know, there's certain lifestyle spends that I've gotten used to. 
And I've gotten to a point now where the income from my property can sustain and cover that. That goal takes about five to 10 years to achieve. The final level is financial freedom. This is when money no longer becomes a concern. This is where you can travel wherever you want. You can buy an island if you want. You can, you can, you can really enjoy the fruits of your labor. Now, that is a goal that's always changing. You know, and that's that, that 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 that's a goal that you're going to be chasing for the rest of your life. That's going to take 10 to 15 years to achieve, and that's when you know money no longer really becomes a concern. So your main focus should be in the next three to five years. I need to get financial security where I have enough passive income covering my basic necessities, so that if I had to lose my job, I wouldn't be homeless and I wouldn't be stuck in a really difficult situation. Now, with financial security. You want to be going for buy to lets. You want to be buying a couple of flats in Berea and Primrose, wherever it is. Get enough income to cover your status. Then when you go to financial independence, you want to be looking at maybe some more advanced strategies, going multi-lets, student accommodation, blocks of flats, and then financial freedom. This is where you can expand. It's like the corporate ladder, right? You start at the bottom, you do some of the grunt work, and then slowly but surely you expand and you go into more difficult and greater levels of responsibility. Same with property. You start at the bottom, you start small, you reach your first goal, you then expand. The final section of this quick educational is just to look at your finance options when you're looking at property. Now, your best and cheapest form of finance is going to be bank finance. Okay. The only issue is that it is the most restrictive finance as well. Okay. So it's cheap and widely accessible, but you have to meet their criteria. Okay. If you don't meet their criteria, bank finance is not possible. What are their criteria? Simple. Four things. Credit score, affordability, property type, investment vehicle. Now, your credit score, uh, this is something you can go and find out at any point in time. I use a website called clearscore.com, 100% free. It tells you what your credit score is. Here you can see from Uber, which is a bond originator, that anything below sort of your 650 uh, is going to be average. So if you're in below average or very poor, the bank is going to see you as a high risk candidate and they're probably going to, if they loan to you, they're going to loan to you at unattractive terms. Affordability is uh, any kind of income that you can show the bank that will be able to pay for the bond. So your full-time salary, you know, weekly wages, commission, uh, rental income at 80%, future rental income at 55%. So the higher your affordability, the greater your affordability, the greater the loan facilities that the bank will give to you. Property type and investment vehicle. So your property type, if you're going commercial properties or retail or industrial, that's a higher risk to the bank, which means they will give you less attractive terms. An investment vehicle, if you buy in your personal name, the banks love that, versus a company name, the banks are a little bit more hesitant. So let's look at two, um, at two candidates. These are two people that are looking to take a home loan from the bank, and let's see how they fare. So first, we've got applicant one, Ashman. His credit score is 650, which is fantastic. He's got good affordability with a steady 30,000 Rand coming in per month. He wants to buy a residential property in his personal name. Now, this is the kind of candidate that the bank is going to just throw money at because they, he just checks all the boxes, right? Our second candidate, Jonah, has got a lower credit score. She's a student or just a recent student. She's just finished her studies. So she's got this debt from her student loan and she hasn't been paying it so well. So her credit score is a little bit iffy. She's only got 10,000 Rand coming in per month because she's just started as an intern. She wants to go straight into a commercial high risk property and she wants to buy it in her company's name. This is the kind of candidate the bank is going to say, you know what, you don't, you don't really meet our criteria. We, you know, we'll maybe give you a loan, but we're not going to give you a high loan to value. We're not going to give you a good interest rate. You know, it, it's probably going to be a tough conversation. So between the two of these people, you know, applicant one is the green candidate, the candidate that the banks really like. They'll most likely give them a 100% loan to value, which means that the property is a million rand. They'll give them a million rand loan. So 100% of the property purchase price, they'll cover. And they'll probably give a good interest rate, something below prime over a 20-year period. Right? Applicant two, Jonah, unfortunately, they're going to say, you're a high-risk candidate. We'll give you 80% of the property price. So of the million rand, they're only going to give 800,000, which means Jonah now needs to put 200,000 rand as a down payment to make this deal happen. Interest, probably going to be quite high, prime plus two or something similar over a 20-year period. So unfortunately, guys, the banks are very restrictive, but if you can meet their criteria of a good credit score, good affordability, property type and investment vehicle, it's an infinite source of 
wealth or, or funding that you can use to invest in property. Uh, just to end, I wanted to share a, a quick case study and testimonial of one of my most recent students, Mongezi. He's an electrical engineer based out in Richards Bay, and he joined my coaching program uh, in the beginning of 2021. Uh, before meeting me and before working with me on my cash flow model, he had bought several properties, but they were all negative cash flow. So he bought one in 2016 that was losing 1,600, another one in 2017 that was losing 1,700, and then he has his residential home. Now, the, the, the trick with this is as you buy these negative cash flows, what happens to your affordability is it reduces, and you start to go from being the Ashwin applicant to the Jonah applicant because your affordability suffers, which means the bank says you're less loanable. We can give you less money to invest. And the whole thing about property, the reason why I love it so much is because you can leverage OPM, other people's money. So anyway, he decided to change strategy. He wasn't buying residential anymore. He went straight into student accommodation. So this is an 11-bedroom house in Musgrave, Durban. Um, you can see that there's multiple beds, you know, because there's multiple students living here. There's a little granny flat at the back, which is also being rented out. So he's really making use of the multi-let, the multi-person strategy, which is very lucrative from a yield perspective. So his rent on a monthly basis is 35 or just under 35,000. His expenses, which includes provisions, insurance, rates and taxes, the bond, management, everything is just under 31,000. And he's making a monthly profit every month of 3,700 Rand with a 20% return, right? Because the bank's given him 100% finance. Um, he got it from, I think, Standard Bank or FMB, I can't, I can't quite remember, but one of the big banks gave him 100% finance. So he only had to pay transfer, bond, and, and registration costs. But he was able to now buy a cash flow asset, which covers all the losses he's making with his other properties. And now he can go on to creating more and more wealth. Thank you so much for joining me on this quick um, educational. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about my, my educational programs, go to my YouTube channel. It is free to subscribe and there's tons and tons and tons of free content on there. I also do have a membership program on YouTube where you pay a small fee and you get access to exclusive content to some discounts and you also get to connect with me directly and I'll do some live deal analysis videos on your behalf. So just go to my channel and click subscribe to join for free or click join and you can pay a small fee and join my uh, exclusive content. Um, I also do have a very detailed and structured coaching program where I sit with you on a one-to-one -one basis to help you make a wise investment decision. If you are interested, go to my website, lawrencepool.com, schedule a free appointment with me. We'll sit down for 15 minutes and hopefully I can help you along your property journey. Until next time, happy investing and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your show. All right, so that was Lawrence Bull. Finally got his last name right. And that was some nice information. I haven't heard uh, a lot of that before. Some nice tools that he showed us as well. So if property investments are your thing, uh, I am a firm believer that it is. Um, speak, to, speak to Lawrence, visit his platforms, um, and see how he can assist you in that. All right, so that's it for session two with Lawrence. We're going to take a break. It is 10 past 11. All right, we're going to kick off our final session with Patrice Washington. I know a lot of you are looking forward to that. We're going to kick that off in about 10 minutes or so. So there's your bathroom break and a coffee break. Get your nice um, hot cup of coffee and get ready for our next session. It's a little bit longer, but Patrice has a lot to share. All right, so we'll chat again in 10 minutes and you can uh, join the next session on your uh, timeline that has our uh, the session listing.